Hey everybody, welcome to our uh, Thursday STEM question and answer panel. Uh, I am Major Joe Sabat. My flying call sign is Rabdo, so I'll go by Rabdo here today. I am really excited to be with you. Uh, we're here with you today with four STEM professionals that work all across Edwards Air Force Base. We have rep representatives from the operations group, the maintenance group, the medical group, and the test and engineering group. So a really cool span of all kinds of people working across the base. Uh, we are going to open this thing up to questions. This is the Edwards Air Force Base Hybrid Air Show STEM Expo, the STEM days. Uh, the intent of this is for you guys, the students, out there in the Antelope Valley and across California and the country maybe, uh, to ask questions, learn about what life is like working STEM uh, at Edwards Air Force Base. We're really excited to have you here. Uh, you guys can either text your questions into the Q&A on Zoom or we have a text phone number that you can send your questions in that is shown on the screen right now. So start sending those questions in and we'll get them answered. Before we get going with the panelists, I'm gonna moderate today. This is the last time you guys will see me on camera and then I'll be a, a voice in the background for the rest of it. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself real quick. I am a flight test engineer here at Edwards Air Force Base. I have degrees in mechanical engineering uh, as my bachelor's and then I have masters in aeronautical engineering and flight test engineering. I work as the Director of Operations for the 772nd Test Squadron. We do electronic warfare testing, and then I also do control room uh, missions for the F-22 Raptor, and I get to fly in the backseat of F-16s uh, to conduct some tests as well. Hopefully I'll see you guys out there. I'm uh, currently scheduled to fly in the backseat of one of the F-16s on Saturday for the air show schedule, so I'll be waving as I pass over your house. So hopefully you guys can uh, wave back to me as, as uh, I'm flying over your school or your house. All right, with that, I am going to hand it over to Major Taylor and let him introduce himself, and we'll get started with the STEM Q&A after introductions. Thanks, guys. Hello, everyone. I am Major Chris Taylor, as Rabdo said, and my flying call sign is Beast, so please feel free to call me Beast for the remainder of the conversation today. Uh, as far as education goes, I have undergrad and a master's degree, both in aerospace engineering, and my current job is I'm the director of operations of the 461st Flight Test Squadron. Uh, which means I'm responsible for leading the flight test operations for F-35 tests here at Edwards Air Force Base. Um, and in addition to doing that job, I'm also an experimental test pilot for the F-35 and the F-16. Um, and then before we get into further introductions and the rest of the panel, uh, I will not be doing the flyover tomorrow, unfortunately, I'd love to, uh, but I'm gonna let the pilot that's gonna fly over the school tomorrow, just briefly come on camera and say hi to you all, uh, and then we'll get back to the rest of the introductions. Hey guys, uh, Major Austin Baker, uh, go to call sign of Butcher. Um, I'm a pilot over here at the 461st Flight Test Squadron, and I'll be doing the flyover in the F-35 tomorrow. So really excited to fly over all your schools as loud uh, as possible and as low as we can. Um, and so hopefully it'll be a good show. We're actually about to go mission plan and go brief the sortie right now, but um, definitely give us a big wave. And while we will not be waving from the cockpit because we'll be flying the airplane, um, we'll give you a nice nod as well. So uh, enjoy. Uh, I'm the Assistant Director of Operations here at the uh, 461st. Um, so I work for Beast. So obviously any questions you have for him about the jet, uh, he knows a lot more than I do. And we're excited to fly over tomorrow. So have an awesome session and we'll see you guys later. I think Beast is going to finish up his intro. You guys are on right now. And I'm ready to, to hand off the intro. I work oh. at the public health. I'm the flight chief over there. I've been in the Air Force for about eight years. I've hey, Aaron, we want to let Beast got two kids at home. Intros. I've got a three-year-old and a one-year-old. I've got a degree in public health, and I'm working on my bachelor's degree in software development. Um, my job on base here is to prevent disability, disease, and death by kind of analyzing the population, what kind of diseases are going around, and trying to prevent and stop it by um, hindering the chain of infections. So um, it's obviously been a hard fight with COVID. I got a lot going on there, and I have a lot of information if you guys want to ask questions about that. But otherwise, I'll pass it on to my companion here to introduce herself as well. Go ahead, Danica. Hey guys, my name is Danica Blake. I'm 22. I work over at the um, 412th 
maintenance group in the maintenance flight. I'm an administrative assistant, so a lot of my job consists of technological work with the computer, scheduling training, making sure all my guys who work every day over in fuels, on the jets, where they're all handled and they're doing well, and I take care of them with whatever they need, questions they've got. So I'm pretty much a, a point of connection in my flight. So it's a, it's a really hard job sometimes because I talk to a lot of people on a daily basis. Um, I have my associates in early childhood education. I'm going to be a teacher at some point, um, working towards that right now. So I wanted to be part of something bigger and part of a bigger mission, which is why I joined the civil service while I'm going to school. Awesome. Thanks, Danica. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, my name is Kayla Romero and I am an r and engineer here at Edwards Air Force Base. You're probably thinking, what is r and I will go into that a little bit later, but I work for the 773rd Test Squadron. So that is under TENG, which is the overarching test and engineering. Then it's the 773rd and I was matrix out to the 418th Flight Test Squadron. And there we test the heavy aircraft like KC-46, uh, BC-25B, which is the new Air Force One, as well as C-17, C-5, so all of the mobility aircraft. Um, I was born I was born in Whittier, and then we moved out here to the Antelope Valley, so I'm an Antelope Valley native, and I think that's where my passion grew for aerospace, the industry. So I went to Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Prescott, Arizona, and I played softball there while pursuing my engineering degree, which is pretty tough, but that led me to here at Edwards Air Force Base, and so I will go into R&M a little bit. So... The R stands for reliability, M stands for maintainability, and it's also known as RAM, and the A stands for availability. So we're looking at the overarching, um, let's see, like the maintenance, like how long it takes to repair an item or how available the aircraft is, like if there's something wrong with it, and then reliability is how long it takes to be restored. Awesome. Thanks, Kayla. Uh, I think we're actually going to hand it back to Beast for him to finish his intro. Beast, you out there? All right. Yep, sweet. Thanks, Rabdo. I appreciate that. Uh, just to finish up, I appreciate the opportunity to finish. I uh, grew up in Georgia, um, so actually relatively new to the Southern California area. I moved here about four years ago uh, when I first started flight test, uh, going through the Air Force Test Pilot School, which was about four years ago. Uh, and then I've been doing experimental flight tests, as I said, in the F-16 and the F-35, uh, as well as the F-15 um, for a brief time. I've been doing that since then. Um, just general uh, uh, description of it. So I'm responsible for a large, diverse group of people um, from various disciplines, engineering, maintenance, um, contracting, and all kinds of support personnel um, to plan and then debrief and get lessons learned from various flight test missions. Um, so that's just a brief description of, of what it's like to be a test pilot. Um, with that, I'll hand it back over to Rabdo. All right, awesome. Thanks so much, Beast. With that, we'll get into the questions. So I'm going to ask this first question from Grayson to the entire panel. So Kayla, we'll start with you. We'll go around the room here. Uh, if you guys could just give a quick answer to this. Grayson asks, is your job fun and do you have fun in your job? Perfect question. I do love my job. Um, I think going to school and trying to stay focused, that was the hardest part, but it's been so rewarding to be able to work here at Edwards Air Force Base. And now that I work at the 418th, we're able to do cool things like fly on aircraft if we need to. Awesome. Thanks, Kayla. Dana, what do you, Danica, what do you think? I love my job. It is so much fun. I talk to anywhere from like 70 to 80 people a day sometimes. Um, it's really cool because I can go in the hangar and go look at some jets when we got them in there. Uh, right now we're fixing our hangar, so it's, that doesn't happen. But I normally see a lot of cool things every day, even though my job consists of me behind a desk a lot of the times. But it's, it's a lot of fun. I like talking to people. I like helping as much as I can. And my favorite part about it is that I can go out and look at jets anytime I feel like it. Awesome, Danica. <laughs> Sergeant Luna, what do you think? Do you have fun? Oh, I love, 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 love my job. I've got a great team. 
Um, I love logic puzzles, so it's always for me to go backwards. It's like a detective where you've got some disease going on, and you may not even know what the disease is. You've got people with symptoms. You've got to go backtrack and question them, and who have they been around, and what have they done? And you you come back to this place where you're like, oh, this is where this infection is coming from. And then you've got to come up with a solution to stop it. And it's just like a giant puzzle. So since I'm a puzzle nerd, I have fun every day. I love it. Very cool. Beast, how about you? Do you have fun flying the F-35? Absolutely. Grayson, thanks for the question. Uh, you know, work is, is obviously difficult at times, but it's important to have fun. And, and I absolutely have all kinds of fun. I mean, obviously there's the thrill of flying, which is incredible, visceral thing. It's very challenging. And especially in the test world, we get to fly with an emphasis of, you know, on engineering and mathematics. And you get to combine that love that I have for STEM topics with flying. But most importantly, and I think the rest of the panelists have already said this, uh, what makes my day fun every day is the incredible people that I get to work with uh, in this business. All right, next up, I'm gonna go to a personal question. So Sergeant Luna, over to you. How has social media changed your involvement or interaction with STEM? That's a really good question. Um, so with my job, it, most of it is education and it's, it's getting people the right information so that they can protect themselves against disease and understanding that social media is our main platform for people to get information now. So we've transformed from um, these journals and these news articles and this is how people get information to things like memes and funny videos on social media to get our, our information across because you shouldn't believe everything you read on the internet. So trying to get those reliable scientific resources out through social media, through a major platform, and having that being shared is a more effective way. I mean, it's, it's hashtag trending on Twitter, right? I mean, who doesn't pay attention to that? So if we can get that information, reliable information out there, we get more people equipped with ways to protect themselves from disease or what's going on in their community and informed. It's the fastest and most effective way. Um, so social media has completely transformed public health and our ability to educate our population. Very cool, thanks. Beast, we had a question come in from Denari. What would you say to the people that want to be in the Air Force? Uh, well, thanks, Denari, for the question. Uh, I would say if you're interested, um, I think we've already highlighted from the people that are talking on this uh, panel that there is a lot of opportunity for fun. There's a lot of opportunity for learning, uh, especially if you're interested in STEM topics. Uh, it's a challenging career. Um, it is a difficult career, but I would say if you're interested and you have a love of aviation and space, uh, then the Air Force and the Space Force are a place to go. So I, I'd say if you're all about it, um, do it. It's awesome. I've had a great time and I, I don't regret it at all. Awesome. Thanks, Beast. Uh, Danica, so you grew up here locally in the AV. What was it like growing up near Edwards and now working here at Edwards? Oh, man. So uh, I've, yeah, as you said, I've, I've grown up here, um, right, born in Lancaster, brought home here. I lived on base for eight years. I attended um, all the schools here on base from kindergarten to 12th grade, uh, graduated from Desert High School, go Scorpions. Um, it's, it's been really interesting, you know, like as a kid, I looked at the base and I was like, man, this place is great. Like, it's got everything. And then as I got older, I really learned the history behind the space, you know, from filmmaking to Chuck Yeager, um, NASA's program here. Like it's, as I keep continuing to grow older and now that I work here, I just learn more and more things about Edwards and our mission and how we're of vital importance to the Air Force. And what we do here is amazing. You know, all of the testing that we do and the achievements we accomplish. And it's just, it's a really unique place to be a part of something. And I, I'm very fortunate that I'm able to come back to my home and work here and now follow in my parents that work here, my brother works here. So we all kind of jumped in on the mission and trying to contribute. It's really fun. Very cool. Thanks. All right, Kayla, this one's a two-parter for you. So Nicole asks, how big are your aircraft? You get to work on some pretty cool big aircraft and specifically an upcoming aircraft for the president. So what's it like working and testing an aircraft for the president? Okay, so the first part of the question, how big are the aircraft? Um, I don't know the dimensions off the top of my head, but all I can know, all I can tell you is they're pretty big. Um, <laughs> in comparison to 
the small fighter aircraft like the F-16s, the F-35s, they are pretty tiny compared to the tankers like the KC-46, the KC-10, the KC-135. Um, so it's a little bit different, but I think the art of aerial refueling is pretty cool. And just think of it, as mentioned yesterday from Lieutenant Colonel Schaefer, it's a flying gas station. This It's in simplest terms, it's a flying gas station, but I thought that was pretty neat. And then the second part, um, I think it's pretty cool being able to work on the presidential aircraft, which is VC-25B. It's such a high, um, it's such a high profile aircraft and being able to be a part of that is pretty neat. And even though we're gonna, we're still in the early phases of it, but I think once it's all set and done, it's gonna be a pretty awesome jet. Awesome. That sounds like a super exciting way to engage in STEM work. All right, I'm going to ask this question to Beast first, and then we'll get Sergeant Luna in as well. What is different from this Air Force base than others? Well, uh, there's a lot of things that are different. The first thing is our focus on tests. Now, it's not the only base. Um, uh, in the African uh, space as Eglin, uh, but as the base commander likes to refer to it as this is the center of the aerospace testing universe. This is a large base that's almost exclusively devoted to flight tests. Sorry, I shouldn't say flight tests, all forms of testing. Uh, so that's one thing that's unique is we see a lot of things a lot earlier than you would see them at other Air Force bases. Uh, another unique thing, which I always like to give a shout out to our folks that maintain aircraft here is there's a large number of very diverse aircraft um, which is incredible. Well, and I think you'll all be able to see that tomorrow and on Saturday, um, both in the live telecast here, but also in the flyovers, that there's an incredibly uh, large, diverse set of aircraft that are uh, being worked on. Um, so for that reason, it's very unique. And probably the third thing is the personnel here. We, we have a, I think a lot of people think of, obviously it's important to think of those. The majority of the personnel that work at this base are actually um, civilian um, engineers as well as contractors and just to emphasize like how important that team is and how it's probably unique to most Air Force bases and that there's a large number of players uh, that are responsible for us getting flight tests done. So for those kind of three reasons, if you will, uh, this base is very unique and, and pretty special place. That's awesome. Thanks for the answer, Beast. Uh, Sergeant Luna, what is unique about this base from others that you've been to? So specifically as it applies for me for public health and like I said, understanding a population and what goes into that as far as diseases are concerned, Edwards is different and there is a very large civilian population that works here compared to other bases. So um, knowing my demographic of people is different will tell me how a disease will act differently in a population. So that's interesting here that I have to uh, reapply my knowledge of public health and a, my base understanding of that scientific process to a new group of people and come up with some solutions. Um, also, this is a test base. And so when we have new ideas on how to control and, um, you know, prevent diseases, we, we can actually bring those up and we won't get like a, no, we don't want to try anything new. We're just going to keep doing what we're doing. We get a, okay, let's try it. Lay it out for me. What are we going to do? And we're able to be ahead of the game and, um, you know, the tip of the spear when it comes to fighting disease. So Edwards honestly has been different in that nature that I feel very connected to understanding my population and the ability to try things that we think will help solve big crises when it comes to disease, so. Great, thanks for that. Uh, hopefully that answered your question there, Luis. All right, so this one we're gonna go, each of you is gonna get a chance to answer this one. What was your favorite subject growing up in school? Danica, we'll start with you. Um, I am a history nerd, so history was definitely overall my favorite subject and followed right behind that was science. Those are my two strongest areas of school that I was a part of, um, I, I think with history, it's just because to learn about where we've come from and where we're going, to see the progress we've made throughout time and how much we've done over the years, that to me is the most interesting part about it. And to learn from our past and how we can go forward and do better, that's why I love history. And then science, it's just, it's very hands-on most of the time. So whenever I came to science experiments, I was very like, I'll do it, <laughs> I'll be the test person. So those are my, my two favorite. 
that's a really cool answer, actually, and maybe something that we wouldn't expect talking about STEM, mm -hmm. right? So what would you say to maybe students, what motivated you to get into STEM, or um, how, did, how did that work growing up kind of liking history but then going into a STEM career field? Um, so even though history is not a part of STEM, um, I mean, it is kind of because a lot of the science basis that we know you know, there's history to it, like where we've come from, just barely knowing about atoms and molecules. We've gone so far with that. So history ties into science, even though history is not a part of STEM specifically. But it definitely pushed me to become a part of STEM because I wanted to know more. Like, I, I always want to learn more and further my knowledge in any field. So on a daily basis, I'm part of the technology branch of STEM, and um, I use technology every day so that's kind of where I got in, involved with my STEM career was just wanting to further my knowledge. Very cool. Sergeant Luna, what was your favorite subject growing up? Um, twofer as well. Right. Math. I loved math. I love being able, like I said, solve those puzzles. Oh, like, what is, smart. how do you get there? I know. But I tell you what, I really do use math all the time so it's very useful. Uh, my second was probably anatomy, physiology, biology, and uh, I think the reason I really liked that was a very hands-on, as we got to dissect animals and whatnot. <laughs> and so, it, but it's really cool to learn something in a book and then look at it in real life and kind of apply your knowledge. So, I mean, that's those were my favorite subjects, the the, the subjects where I got to actually do the things that they were teaching us. Um, yeah, math and anatomy. Yeah. Cool. Kayla, what was your favorite subject? I would have to say math, too. I really enjoyed math. Um, I had really great teachers all throughout high school and even um, throughout college, too. Uh, I would have, have to also say science. Um, I'm not so much as a life science person. I like physical science, like chemistry. Um, I also took astronomy in high school, which was pretty neat because my teacher, he was actually in the aerospace industry, and he kind of wanted to branch out and teach students about different types of sciences, and he chose astronomy, which I thought was pretty cool. Awesome. East, over to you. What was your favorite subject growing up? Well, I'll actually maybe take a different tack here because I think two people have already mentioned math. I would actually say that math was not one of my favorite subjects growing up, and I bring that up to say that maybe that was one reason that motivated me to go into some, some something like engineering, but I actually, math was not my favorite subject growing up and struggled with it a little bit, but I, uh, just bring that up as an example is, uh, still can kind of get put into the engineering, uh, but to answer, I would have to say science actually. And again, kind of the physical sciences, I had some great teachers growing up and, uh, you know, stay, stay safe out there, kids. But I always enjoyed teachers that had cool chemistry experiments that involved stuff bubbling over, or maybe small explosions, uh, things along those lines. So science and especially, I guess, probably chemistry was always something that I found very fascinating. Over to you, Rabdo. Good answer. Way to bring that around, Beast. Uh, I'm going to go back to you, Beast. Is it scary to test a plane? And have you ever had any emergencies? Oh, gosh. Uh, I don't know that I'd use the word scary. Um, I think if anyone is familiar with the history of flight tests, uh, they'd know that it's a risky business to be sure. Uh, but I don't know that I'd say it's scary. One way we get around some of the risks involved is lots of training, uh, lots of preparation. We have a great team here that kind of backs us up when we're in the air. So definitely not scary, uh, but uh, there's risk there associated with uh, flying uh, that I think we're all aware of, um, but uh, it is, it is definitely not scary. It's a pretty fun and challenging um, line of work. So not scary. Uh, there are risks involved, but again, yeah, we're a great team. There's a lot of training is the, the, is that we do. Awesome. Uh, that question was from Galilea. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, great question. Um, I'm going to take this one around to everybody again, and we'll start with Kayla. Was this always your dream to work here? I think it was my dream. Um, I remember in middle school, I it was our eighth grade year, and we had to do this me book, and one of the projects was your future career. And to this day, I went back and checked, and I had aerospace engineered down there, and I wanted to work for either like NASA or Edwards Air Force Base because I grew up here, and I think – that really affected what I wanted to do in my life. So I would have to say, yes, it's always what I wanted to do. 
Great, thanks. Danica, how about you? Has this always been your dream? Uh, originally, I never thought about it. I didn't think I'd find myself back home, but now that I'm here and I'm doing this, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of being a part of this, and I'm, I'm glad I came back and I started my career here, and I'm very fortunate that even though it wasn't initially my dream and where I hoped to be, I'm, I'm very proud to say that I'm here and what I'm doing, and I, I feel a part of something bigger. Awesome. Sergeant Luna? So not even close, <laughs> not even a little bit. Um, I wasn't even expecting to join the Air Force um, and let alone public health. I started off wanting to be a cop like my dad. So um, then I learned really quickly that I was, I was really interested in psychology and people. And then I took a computer course in college. And so like I just all over the place and I fell in love with computers. And I actually joined the Air Force um, so that I could help further my understanding of software because they are very keen on that kind of thing. So I, I, I thought, man, this is my path. And then I joined, and they're like, just kidding, public health. <laughs> and you know what? At first I was like, ah, oh, man, I'm not sure about this, but I did like anatomy in school. I like medical. Let's try it out. And then um, it really did work out in my favor because I still take those basic skills that I love doing every day, which is solving puzzles, and I just look at it that way. And it's my perspective that public health, maybe I was always meant to do it, and I just ended up here. But no, originally I wanted to be a cop and uh, run around and, you know, help people obey the law. Now I'm telling people to wear a mask. So yeah. I, I am happy, though. I am very happy with where I ended up. You get to play that's that cool. cop role a little still, bit with telling people to, to wear go. masks, yeah. right? Yeah, that's cool. That's awesome. How about you, Beast? Was this always your dream? I, I think so. I may not have known it in name early enough to be able to say that, but I think if you looked at anything I wrote when I was a younger kid or asked my parents, I think you would find that I said I wanted to be an inventor when I was growing up, uh, which... I think they certainly always did their part to try to help encourage that. But at one point they're like, well, you know, that's, that's a good one. But I mean, what do you want to invent and who do you want to work for? And I think after a lot of thought, I'd always been interested in flying. So as I got old enough to kind of understand what the options are out there pretty early on, uh, probably in the middle school time frame, I knew I wanted to be a test pilot. So here I am. Very cool. All right, uh, we're going to go around the room again for this one. And the question is going to be, what part of STEM do you use the most? Sergeant Luna, why don't you start us off? So there's uh, two, science, obviously, um, specifically the chain of infection and understanding viruses and bacteria and how they move from one person or host or vector or source from another. Um, and that basic understanding is really all you need to apply to big situations. Um, I use that daily to understand, hey, people ask me, you know, what if we do this? Is this safe? And I really have to go back and say, okay, well, how is that bacteria spread? Are they doing something that would allow that to happen? And it just, I use that every day. Math, I use math all the time. And that's in my analytics. So it's like where you look at a population and you say that there's a higher percentage of, you know, sick people in this area versus this area. And being able to identify that, you have to know how to do the math to get there. You have to know how to, what your denominator is in your population. You have to know um, what, what are you looking for. And, and doing that math helps you pinpoint your prevention and control measures. So um, if I didn't use science or math, um, i I, we would be lost and disease would be everywhere. So I use it, I use it every day. Yeah. That's cool. Danica, how about you? Um, a, a lot of what I do consists of technology. I use a lot of programs for my job, um, most of which consists of me scheduling, planning, um, setting people up for their position to make sure that they're able to go forth with their job. Um, I do use a little bit of basic math when it comes to some of the data that I collect to push on to my supervisors and say, hey, this is what's going on. These are the numbers. This is what I gathered. So there's a little bit of math in my job. It's just not as intense as your job. <laughs> and luckily, because I'm not good at math, but I'm glad that I'm a part of STEM and I'm, I'm learning a lot. And you know, when I was a lot of your guys' ages, STEM wasn't really a widely talked about subject. It wasn't really around as much as it is now. So it's cool for me to learn more about it, even in my adult years. And pushing it onto my job where I didn't even think it would kind of be a part of it. So it's cool. Kayla, how about you? What's the, the most useful part of STEM in your job? I would have to say math. When we are doing analysis, we're looking at thousands of records. And so we have to determine the metrics. So when I talk about R&M, 
if you look at all the acronyms, it's pretty much like alphabet soup because you have mean time to repair, mean time to between failure, um, re mean repair time. So there's a whole bunch of different uh, equations that we use for RNM. And once we do our analysis, we also use statistics to come up with confidence bounds. So like the upper confidence limit, the lower confidence limit, so things like that. So mainly we use math for our analysis. And then engineering wise, when we look at records, we have to learn how to tie it. So it's kind of figured out how to tie a puzzle together as Sergeant Luna mentioned. So it's kind of like that, um, tying records together or making a story that fits. Great, thanks. Beast? Well, that's a really tough question. Uh, if I had to pick one, I would say engineering. Uh, it probably makes sense uh, from the large number of engineers that we have in the squadron that support flight tests and the engineering analysis and judgment that goes into preparing, executing, and um, getting the proper lessons learned from each flight. It's definitely engineering, but not to drag on the question. I mean, mathematics is heavily involved uh, as a basis for engineering. Uh, even science, I did a, was involved in a test campaign in my last squadron a few years ago where we were actually looking at like uh, blood uh, chemistry in terms of oxygen uh, carrying capacity, um, based on some issues they've been seeing in the Air Force. So we were heavily involved in biology and anatomy um, and then technology, obviously, when you're testing some very advanced aircraft, it's all there. Uh, but I guess engineering is probably uh, the basis of everything. Very cool. So for Kayla and Danica, this next question comes from Violet. I think it'll be a very quick question for you guys, so I'll let you answer first. Violet asks, how often do you get to go home to see your family? We're going to take it to a little bit more of a personal note. So, uh, Kayla, how often do you get to go home to see your family? Um, pretty often. I mean, we, I probably live maybe 17, 20 minutes from them, so it's not that far. It's, like, right down the freeway. Nice. Danica, how about you? Oh, man, it varies. Uh, whenever I'm missing my family, I have someone who's five minutes down the road from me. I have someone over in Boron. I have family here on base. Um, I have family, well, I can't see them every day, but Washington and Georgia. But that's what's really cool about technology now is I can FaceTime my sister who's over in the Army and training and they'd be like, hey, how's it going? Like, I miss you. So immediately, yeah, I'm like 10, 15 minutes from a lot of my family. So I get to see them quite often. Cool. Sergeant Luna, how about you? Where's your family at and how often do you get to see them? My family uh, live in Kentucky. So um, I, I pretty much only get to see them once or twice a year, depending. Uh, they do come out and see me a couple of times. But like she said, with technology, I, I talk to them almost every day through FaceTime or through the messenger on Facebook. And I'm able to see them um, and spend time with them. And I think that it's not the big moments where I get to go home for big events. It's those little everyday moments that I spend with my family that matter to me. That it's just talking about your day. So I, I, yes, I don't get to see them in person very often, but they're still a big part of my life. Great. Beast, how about you? How often do you get to see your family? Sure. So my parents and siblings, um, they're spread all over. I see them for the holidays every once in a while in person. Uh, my sister, one of my sisters actually is also in the Air Force. Um, so opportunities to see are uh, infrequent, but several times during the, I mentioned it already us to communicate and see each other in a, in a virtual manner, which isn't the same, but still it's quite special, uh, quite often. Uh, but if the question was more towards like, how often am I seeing my family here? I mean, my uh, awesome wife, my one-year-old daughter, um, you know, we work pretty hard, but uh, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a work hard, play hard. So plenty of time to spend time with uh, my family here. Sounds great. All right, we've had a couple of uh, Air Force specific questions. So I'm going to ask a civilian specific question to Kayla and Danica here. Danica, we'll start with you. What is your favorite technology in your personal life? Something not work related? Oh, man. Uh, it's going to be really cheesy, but my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Only because there's so many things you can do with it. I mean, I, I watch Netflix on there, I search the internet on there, I used to do my homework on my phone. So um, I, I take pride in having my cellular device because it's very universal. You can do so many different things with it. So um, as cliche as it sounds, my phone is my favorite. <laughs> sounds good. Kayla, how about you? What's your favorite personal technology? I would have to say my phone, too. There's a, it's just so small, and you can pretty much reach anything. 
Um, I go on Pinterest a lot to yes. look at different <laughs> recipes and stuff or ideas around the house. Um, but just having a phone so small, you could read the newspaper, like the New York Times on there, or you can watch YouTube videos. Um, you could learn things like learn how to code on YouTube. Um, there, you can just reach anything through the internet and on your phone too. Cool. All right, so I'm going to ask this one to everybody again. Uh, Delilah asks, is COVID-19 affecting your work at all? Beast, why don't you start us off with that one? Sure, absolutely. Um, I mean, you could talk about the larger effects on society, and it's kind of upended a lot of things. Um, and in flight test business, it's, it's really hard to do most of our work remotely. Um, we have a lot of work that has to be done in person. Uh, so it's definitely um, made things more difficult, but I had also argue that it's made us smarter about what's essential to be done in person, about what can be done remotely. Um, and we take steps to make sure we can keep the whole, uh, uh, all of our team safe um, from COVID. But uh, yeah, it's definitely made it more difficult. Uh, it's something on our minds, but I think, you know, with the fantastic and smart, intelligent people and with help from folks like public health, uh, we're able to execute pretty safely uh, and still just as effectively as we were before. Great, thanks. Kayla, how about you? Is uh, COVID-19 affecting how you work? Yes, um, we've been teleworking for a while now, so getting used to that was a little bit hard at first, and now I've gone into the swing of things. But I do miss seeing the people that I work with on a daily basis. I like having conversations with them. Although we still communicate through Teams or whatever phone, like either phone or video, um, it's still nice to be able to communicate with someone one-on-one -on -one or in person face-to-face. -face. So I think I do miss that the most, but I feel like we're able to stay on task and do a lot of the things that we do on a daily basis through teleworking. Cool. Danica? Yeah, I, uh, when I first started my job, I was here for three weeks before we left for um, COVID measures. So I went straight into wow. teleworking right after learning my job. And uh, I was very sad because I'm a very social person. So going from seeing everybody at work and talking to everybody on a daily basis, just saying, good morning, how are you doing? Uh, how, how can I help you? It was a struggle for a little bit because I, I was expecting to be in the workplace and I was sitting at home on my computer. <laughs> but now it's, it's cool because I can still talk to people. It's just remembering, you know, social distancing, got to wear a mask, don't go hang out with people for too long. Little things like that where it's made it a challenge, but it's, it's definitely more convenient being back at work versus at home. Yeah, but it sounds like technology has kind of bridged that gap and allowed oh, working from home to be a little bit easier. Definitely. Sorry, Luna, I think this is a no-brainer for you, but how has COVID-19 <laughs> affected your work? COVID-19 um, actually put, it helped highlight a lot of things that people don't realize about public health, which is that if we're doing our job and preventing disease, you really don't notice us. Um, we don't have a lot to say, like, except for a good job, keep it up. And then when these new measures come out or a pandemic comes out, we have to re rethink how we do our job. We, we came together. I want to say that it, it was with people and with technology at the same time. So my team are amazing. And we were at the same time we were telling other people they need to stay home and telework. We had to do the same while also, you know, being on the forefront of fighting COVID. So we had to come together as a team to figure out platforms, technology to um, still do our job, calling patients, talking to people, talking to other teams on base. And it, it was it was very difficult to get it set and then now that we're all back together there's nothing that replaces that human connection in a team um so i think that to answer to sum it up um your my team is my most important asset and having them together um after covid is probably the best thing that has happened for everybody on base when it comes to public health <laughs> cool uh so delilah hopefully that answered your question i'm gonna go for a quick question around the room here sergeant luna to you first Brinley asks, how long have you been in the Air Force? I have been in the Air Force for eight and a half years. So um, I enlisted out of Wisconsin, and I went to off at Air Force Base for a couple of years, which is in Nebraska. I deployed, and then I came here. So I've been here about three years, 
and I love every bit of it. I've learned and grown so much. Cool. Danica, how long have you worked for the Air Force? Oh, uh, since February. I'm quite new, <laughs> um, but I learned some really good values that I recognize with our military members here when I was in junior ROTC at Desert. So um, that got me about as close as I could get without actually working here, but now that I work here, it's been uh, almost a year. Cool. Kayla, how about you? How long have you been working for the Air Force? A little under a year, so I'm going to hit my year mark on the 28th. So. I'm still fairly new here, but over the past year, I have learned so much, learned different things about Edwards Air Force Base, the people here trying to actually figure out, oh, what aircraft does this specific squadron work on? I think that was kind of tough, but I, like I said, I've learned a lot here, and there's a bunch of classes that TENG offers, too, so I took a professional writing class or professional presentation class, and I think Edwards does a pretty good job at offering different types of classes to civilian and enlisted airmen. Great. Beast, how long have you been in the Air Force? Well, Ravdo, I think it's about one year longer than you have been in the Air Force. So uh, <laughs> I started the Air Force Academy summer of 2003, so about 17 years ago. And it was four years at the Air Force Academy and then uh, 2000. And seven, so, so 13 years ago, uh, full time active duty point. Cool. Back to you. Um, Kayla, I'm going to ask you maybe if you can answer this one. How long does it take to build an airplane? If you don't know the answer to that, maybe you can talk about how long it takes to design and then finally uh, deploy an airplane into service. Okay, so I'll give you a short answer a oh, really great. long time. <laughs> it takes a long time to design it and then to test it. And after you test it, you have to go back and start the engineering process all over again and try and fix any bugs that it has. So in general, I don't know, it could take several years, like four or five longer years. It depends on the type of aircraft as well. Beast, I'll hand that one back to you. So you went to the Air Force Academy, you said 17 years ago. What did you know right. about the F-35 then, and now you're flying the F-35? How long does it take to build or deploy an airplane? Well, I'd say the answer to that is it, it depends. To, to kind of answer Rabdo's question, the, the actual announcement that the F-35 was going to be the next uh, aircraft in the Air Force actually happened when I was in high school. So it was quite a while ago. Uh, and I would argue that building the basics of an airplane uh, that happened pretty quick. Uh, if news was recently in, in just under a year, that's simple. And airplanes are really not so much the aerodynamics, um, although that's still difficult as well. Uh, but airplanes have lots of software. They have lots of capabilities and lots of things that are relatively new to aviation industry. And those are very difficult. So to say that we're still testing the F-30 many, many years after us, first announced that that aircraft would um, go into its initial test uh, just I think highlights how, how difficult this business is especially as airplanes get more and more complicated beyond just the basic aerodynamics of that they can get into the air so the answer is it de depends I think you can probably get a flyable order but a, a, uh, excellent additional technology um, that we expect in our airplanes these days that takes much much longer and even when an airplane is fielded and out there from a military perspective and it's being used uh, by the end user, uh, military members that aren't in test, uh, we continue testing those aircraft for years. Cool, sounds so good. So I don't know if I answered the question so purely. a two-part question here. This is from Sebastian and Yaley. So what do you guys like about your job? Why are we not? And are you happy with your job? Do you get tired sometimes? What are some of the downsides? So Danica, why don't you start us off for that one? love that I'm the point of communication for my flight. So by that, I mean when information needs to go out, me and my coworker are the ones that send out that information. When people need training, my coworker and I are the ones that schedule people for training. So I think just the fact of how important my job is is why I love it. Um, and the only downside sometimes is that my job consists of using a com computer. So if we don't have internet, which sometimes happens, <laughs> I can't do my job unless I printed it out on paper and I can walk paper around, but you, you can't determine, oh, the internet's gonna go out in an hour, so 
the internet goes down, I'm pretty much just sitting there waiting for something to do. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, I'll ask a follow-on question too to you, Danica. Delilah's sister is mm -hmm. wondering how many hours you work in a day. Um, I work the eight-hour typical shift. Um, you know, if I need to stay, I'll stay later because, you know, the mission is vital that we, we stay and we complete our job to the fullest and it wouldn't be fair if I had something else to do and that hinders what other people need done if I left because I was like, oh, I put in my eight hours, I'm done. So typically eight hours, but sometimes, you know, I, if I need to, I'll stay later. It just varies. Makes sense. Mission oriented. Sergeant Luna, how about you? What do you like most about your job or what do you don't like and do you get, do you get tired sometimes? Oh, everybody gets tired sometimes. I think that's completely normal. Um, I love my job because I get to work with people because I get to see, I think that's the part that, that keeps you going. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I can see the results of what I've done. I can, I can say I, I grinded and I worked and I, and I did all this stuff and I can look out in my community and say, look, they're safe and I helped do that. Um, and that kind of makes me feel fulfilled. And they say when you're when you're having fun at work, it's like you're not even working at all. You're you're just it's not a job. You, you're having fun. And so you got to find those fun moments at work, and you have to find your purpose in what you're doing. And seeing it really helps out, especially with COVID and keeping our community safe. Um, every day I go to work, I look, I come home, and I'm like another safe day, another good day. And and I helped do that. So I I am very happy with my job. So it's good to know. All right, Beast, over to you. What do you like and don't like? Do you get tired sometimes? Sure. I, what do I like? Uh, I mean, I think we talked about it a little bit earlier, but uh, clearly one of the nice benefits of the job is get to fly. Uh, it's an incredible experience that I can't speak more highly of, and it's really awesome. Um, but also, as I said earlier, I think it's important to say that probably the best thing about this job, because uh, they say people in this business a lot of times, especially from other people. Uh, so the best part about my job is I get to work with some of the finest people uh, this world has to offer. And I think that's incredible. Uh, if you asked about getting tired, uh, as some of the other panelists have said, for sure, this job can be stressful, which might be, I guess, uh, if any downside of in the flight test business, it's that it's, it's hard work. Um, you have some time, you definitely have time to spend with your family and to, to do other activities that are important to you. But there are times you have to surge and you, you work pretty hard and it can be stressful. Uh, and it can be really busy. Uh, but again, I always lean back and fall back on the fact that those credible people that you're around, even when it, you're tired and even when it's stressful, even when those downsides creep up a little bit, uh, they're there to make it worthwhile and to make you laugh uh, and let you keep on going even when you're tired. So back over to you. Yeah, that's great. The uh, people in the mission can really make a difference. Kayla, how about you? What are your favorite and least favorite parts of your job and do you get tired? Um, I would also have to agree that I do enjoy working with the people that I work with. Um, everyone at the squadron is like a family and even at the home office, everyone cares about you. Um, so I like that part about the job. And as Danica mentioned earlier, we're part of something bigger than us. And I think I like that as well. Um, I feel like, ev like as Sergeant Luna said, everyone gets tired. And I think I kind of get tired because of teleworking and we have to look at a computer screen all day. And unlike when we were in person, we were able to go to the meetings and be able to see the people face to face. So I think looking at a computer screen all day can be a little bit tiring. Cool. All right, I'm going to go right back to you, Kayla. Okay. How much gas does a plane take, asks <laughs> Alina. Oh. Do you know how much gas is in uh, one of the tankers? Um, I would have to say... I think the KC-46 has maybe 20,000 pounds of gas. I don't know how many gallons that is, but um, they are able to transfer the fuel pretty quickly. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I think if I remember, it's something along the lines of like 3.4 gallons per second or something like that. I don't know, so don't quote me on that. <laughs> but if you Google it, I'm sure you'll find the answer. No, that's very cool. And I mean, the KC-46 used to be a passenger aircraft that carried hundreds of people, right? And we just replaced all those people with gas. So yep. there's a lot of gas on that airplane. Beast, how much gas does the F-35 uh, take in a sortie? Uh, sure. So the five carries about seven times. And so it's about six pounds per gallon. So public math, that's about 3,000-ish gallons. 
fight um, fight and then to extend uh, the amount of point the limit becomes the person that's in the airplane uh, because you can continue getting gas uh, from the area of fueling takers. So like I said, 17-ish thousand pounds and about 3,000-ish gallons or so. Um, yep. Very cool. All right. Uh, this one's going to be for everybody again. Uh, if Edwards Air Force Base did not exist, where would you work? Kayla, do you want to start us off? Sure. This is from Chelsea. Okay. Um, ooh, that one's tough um, because... Growing up, I was super interested in military aircraft, so I think I was kind of destined to be here, but <laughs> if Edwards Air Force Base didn't exist, um, I would probably try and work at some of the other company, the aerospace companies like Lockheed Martin or Northrop Grumman or even General Atomics um, because they work on UAVs, um, which I think is pretty neat. So if Edwards didn't exist, I would probably kind of steer towards that kind of the aerospace contractor industry. What are UAVs? Oh, sorry, unmanned aerial vehicles. <laughs> okay, so like the drones that yes. uh, people fly around sometimes? Yes, yeah, so I actually got to make one of those in college. That was my capstone project, and we, were, we flew it and tested it um, out at the local RC field, uh, kind of close to campus, so I thought that was pretty neat. Cool. Danica, how about you? What would you do if Edwards Air Force Base didn't exist? What do you think um, you'd be working? Probably a tie between a school district because that's where my, my knowledge is based at. That's where I came from before I came here. Um, but before I got this job, I was actually trying to get in with Lockheed Martin. So I think if Edwards didn't exist, it would have been one of the two, either a school district or Lockheed trying to advance my knowledge in a different area other than education. Sergeant Luna, what do you think? If Edwards didn't exist, where would you work? Well, I mean, I'm in the military, so I will work wherever they tell me to work. But <laughs> they just send you somewhere else, right? Yeah. <laughs> but if I wasn't doing this job, I would mm -hmm. probably be doing the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta and, and analyzing big data and, and learning about new diseases and, and looking under my, looking through microscope at bacteria. I'd love to do something like that. So I guess if I wasn't doing this, that's where I'd be. Cool. Beast, how about you? If Edwards didn't exist, where do you think you'd work? Well, I think Sergeant Luna took my joke, but uh, I would have said I, wherever the military tells me to go. But if we were to say Edwards doesn't exist and I, I wasn't perhaps in the military, what else would I be doing? I just want to emphasize to the people on this call, I think this is an incredibly exciting time in the aerospace industry. Uh, I mean, you have the traditional companies that have been around for 100 plus years that are still incredible places to work. Uh, I won't hesitate to name everyone because we'd be here for a long time, but you have tons of upstart aerospace companies both with more of your traditional aircraft and then getting into spacecraft and I will say that when I was in high school or middle school the number of companies that were able to launch stuff into suborbital or orbital space were very very limited uh, and just in the last 15 to 20 years there's a ton of upstart companies that are either there or almost there so I would say that I would be working for one of those companies and I would say to those that are on the call, I, I don't know, I haven't been alive that long and I'd be dating myself. I think aerospace has been an exciting career for a long time, but I really do believe that this is, um, this is a time where there's a lot of incredible stuff going on. So I would probably be working for one of those companies. Sounds great. All right, I'm gonna hand it right back to you, Beast. And this is gonna be our final question here. Uh, we got about three minutes left. To, so if you guys could give a quick piece of advice to any of the students out there in the Antelope Valley or any students watching, uh, what would your advice be for STEM? Well, gosh, I, I, I hesitate to sound too much like what you might be hearing from your parents, uh, but I have to say that I think if you looked around the panelists or virtually polled the panelists as we talked earlier about where some of us were when we were in your shoes and what we wanted to do, I think you would find that some people know pretty early and some people find out much later in life what they want to do. So my advice, I think there are a lot of opportunities in STEM. And I think if you study hard in school and use that opportunity to enrich yourself so you can learn some stuff in life, regardless of what you decide to do, even if it's not STEM related, I think it will set you up to be a more informed and better citizen. And if you do decide to pursue STEM, I think uh, 
your time prep now and studying those subjects will you'll yield a lot of benefits later if you decide to pursue that. So stay in school and study hard. Sounds good, Beast. Sergeant Luna, how about you? What's some quick advice for the students out there? So uh, my advice is there is nothing is impossible. And so any idea that you have, go for it and don't stop. Um, you are only so many no's away from somebody saying yes. You just don't know how many. So just keep thinking the yes is just around the corner and you just keep trying. And there is no idea that is too radical or too out there and nothing is impossible. I mean, you've, we've seen it. So don't, don't quit and nothing is impossible. That's great, thanks. Uh, before I hand it over to Danica for her answer, I'm gonna give a quick shout out to the SAGE students. They've been asking for one out there. So yeah. Danica, uh, what's a piece of advice to the SAGE students and the others out there? Uh, just remember STEM is hard, so don't let that discourage you from continuing to try. I mean, you know, when you fail, try again. Just don't ever stop, because when you stop, you're only limiting yourself to what you can possibly do. So if you keep pushing forward and continuing to try, no matter how hard it is, you'll be amazed at what you can accomplish. And I think as long as you keep that in your in your thought process, you'll be able to do anything. You'll be anything you want to be. You'll, you'll grow up to do the things you want to do. So just... That's my advice. Don't quit. Keep pushing forward. And if you need help, don't be afraid to ask. Ask for help. Learn the things you don't know and just learn more things you want to know. Just keep going. That's great. Thanks. Kayla, how about you? What advice do you have for the students out there? On top of all of the panelists' advice, I would also have to say start preparing now. Um, even if you're in middle school, if you're a freshman in high school, it's best to prepare early because you never know what's going to happen and it's best.